Hey, Matt, before we begin uh, today's classic episode, have you ever been in a flame war online? Yeah, back around, I don't know, 2016. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> maybe 20, maybe 2012. Yeah, I've, I've been in my share. How about you? <laughs> Yes, yeah, accidentally. Sometimes when I don't think that I'm in a flame war, because uh, online you can miss a lot of the social cues of communication that would let you know how somebody feels about what you're saying or what they're saying. So I thought we were just having in-depth discussions about things. (laughs) They were a bit heated, but not (laughs) flaming. Right. We're a bit strident. Uh, today's episode is is about this issue. Like, why do arguments proliferate online and why can't people really win them? Or why are your odds of winning an argument uh, so much lower in the world of online communication? I, I think the answers we found hold up. I think they're pretty interesting because they're you know, aside from all the bells and whistles of technology, what we're really looking at is the ancient technology of the human brain and psychology, I guess. And what we find in this episode was pretty disturbing to me. And it really is the reason I'm not on social media right now <laughs> was this conversation, <laughs> I think. I'm pretty sure it goes back to this conversation. Oh, boy. Yeah. So here's why. Let's call this episode Why Matt's Not on Social Media. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. And I am Ben. Most importantly, you are you, we hope, which makes this, as always, stuff they don't want you to know. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get to anything else, before we start the show, we want to do something very important, and that is... Shout Out Corner! That's right, it is the return of our Shout Out Corner. And the first person to get a shout out today is our own Jake Hanrahan, who asked us on Twitter, Hey guys, do do you still do shout outs? We do, Jake, or we do for you. So, welcome, you are officially a member of the Shout Out Corner. Anybody else, Matt? You got shouted out. (laughs) So did you, Heather. You're getting shouted out for saying things while you are apparently intoxicated that are hilarious on Twitter. Thank you. So, uh, we are going to continue our shout out corner. If you would like to have your name read on the air, if you would like to say hi to us, or if you would like us to convey a message to your fellow listeners, there are a couple ways to do it. Uh, you could take a page from Jake and Heather's book and follow us on twitter.com forward slash conspiracy stuff. Or you can just take a page from the Noel Brown book and just be a buddy of mine uh, by the name of Wesley Vaughn, who I turned on the show recently and I wanted to give him a little shouty outy. Oh, yes. Shout out to Wesley as well. And so... You know, I think I think three are good yeah. for a shout out a corner, yeah, right? It's yeah, corner. so it's not a not a room. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, not a room. it's just a corner. <laughs> it's just a corner. Uh, so uh, with that, as always, uh, thank you to Wesley, Jake, and Heather for checking out the show. Thank you to everyone else, all you guys out there listening. Uh, again, we can't emphasize it enough. Our best ideas come from you. We're also on Facebook. We have what else do we have, guys? We have a live show. We do. We do Periscope. You can find us there, uh-huh. Periscope TV. Even though Facebook doesn't want you to know. That's true. And But Facebook will let you know about our Facebook Live posts. Mm-hmm. We alternate. Yeah, we go back and forth. Uh, and our last one was kind of cool because this is a little bit behind the scenes, but Noel, Matt, um, and I hung out with a future special guest uh, who's a, who is a, a super cool guy. I'm like his number one cheerleader, actually, but he he is simultaneously one of the most mysterious individuals that I've ever met. But at the same time, I feel like I could just sit and talk with him and he has the knowledge of a, of a professor. Put it this way, the conversation over lunch veered wildly from alchemy to philosophy, all kinds of esoteric thought to, you know, the Fallout series and um, Dungeons and Dragons rules. So, yeah, you know, it that's was, uh, true. Cut a, quite a wide swath. I enjoy myself immensely. Looking mm-hmm. forward to having him on the show. 
Yeah, this is a this is a friend of mine from a long time ago. But enough about that. You will you will meet him soon because we are going to talk about something different today, which might sound a little bit strange for some of our listeners because we usually cover stuff like uh, cryptids. Oh, and spoiler alert, you guys! I really want to do some cryptids soon. Yeah, if we yeah, if, if I am so ready to cover cryptids, we just gotta we have to find the new ones. Yeah, the ones we haven't covered yet. You guys, I think that sounds like a terrible idea. Get oh, out of here. No. Stop arguing. <laughs> so you guys may have noticed that last week we did a little episode on political conspiracies, which oh, yeah. is one of those things. I think it's politics, religion, and money. Those are the three things oh, the that three are things you shouldn't talk about at dinner or well, at a bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we found out in our YouTube comment section in our videos, uh, uh, specifically in this one, a lot of comments, a lot of people just attacking each other, arguing with each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, it kind of made us want to look into this further. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. We do want to say that we really appreciate uh, every everybody who took the time to check out our YouTube video and to check out our earlier audio episode. We were surprised, you guys. We we thought we would get just excoriated in comments and stuff because we talked about political things. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of people seemed pretty on board. Yeah, there were a lot of people just disagreeing with each other in mm-hmm. what they were writing in the comments rather than what was actually in the video. We ch- we do try to be as unbiased as we can or to be biased toward facts yes. rather than our own opinions. And that's one where I spectacularly uh, broke the rule. You and did. Went on, I went on a rant. Yeah, I think that was a first in our video series, I at least. Think it was a first, but uh, but be that as it may, Matt, the point you make is excellent, uh, and we're going to get to uh, some listener feedback later regarding our political stuff. So stay tuned for that toward the end. But the point that Matt is making now is that we saw arguments. We saw a lot of arguments, and we started thinking, why do people argue online? Why does it seem like there are always a couple people who are, no matter what the video is or Mm -hmm. what the story is, there's always like one or two people who are fighting. And it could be something as innocuous as like a cute, overweight cat who is pushing a a cup off a table or like a puppy that is booping another puppy. And there's somebody in the comments who's always going like, hey, f*** you, buddy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it ranges uh, pretty widely. And it's a weird thing, right? You know where I've found some of the most just completely livid, cantankerous arguments online is that? on local newspapers websites. <laughs> so if especially, oh. you know, especially in the South, because uh-huh. people have a tendency to really uh, let their uh, Confederate flags fly, shall we say. You know, that is a weird thing. I mm. noticed that in looking at a couple articles uh, in in smaller newspapers online, the comment sections that you have to scroll all the way down the page to find are just filled with people yelling and saying horrible things mm. to each other. Vitriol. On, on a, I, I mean, who who goes there to, like, have a discussion? Well, it's like a spoken word uh, open mic night. The only people who are going to watch are also the people who want to perform. Uh-huh. So the people. It's a very, very good analogy. It's man. kind of cruel to spoken word. And I am a fan of spoken word. That's just a reality. Well, that's true of any kind of open mic night for the most part. I mean, you yeah. know, if you've got uh, someone playing acoustic guitar, you know, singing uh, Bob Dylan covers, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's sort of a contract, you know, if you, <laughs> you got to watch the other. The other people doing the Bob Dylan covers before you get your turn to do yours. Right. So. And stand up, uh, open mic nights for comics are, are tough because, you know, comics hate to laugh at each other's jokes. Oh, that's funny. It's yeah. like walking into a church where everyone is angry. Oh, that <laughs> so sounds that? wonderful. Yeah. So what's <laughs> why? the point? Why? Why, why do we do this? Well, it's a great question. This makes us think because we must explore the nature of an argument itself before we get to the strange world of arguing online. So the nature of argument is this. Matt, Noel, me, or every guest host we've ever had, you listening here, and every single person you have ever met, probably, I'm 99% certain, uh, everyone you have ever met is hardwired to prize feeling correct over being correct. Yes. And that's a very important distinction, right? Um there's some chemical reasons for that that we're going to get into, but right. it's just, it is a, it's something you need to know. <laughs> yeah. And evolutionary reasons as well. So everyone's had some sort of argument. It doesn't matter 
who you are, you've had some sort of argument. One of the nicest people I know is a local Atlanta improviser named Mark Kendall. Super nicest guy. But it doesn't matter if he would never himself start an argument. He lives in an argumentative world, right? So uh, think of, you, you know, the nicest person you know who probably had an argument. At some point, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, my roommate Frank, for example, um, and the funny thing is, is he and I both used to live with a mutual friend of ours who is just, he, he lives for arguing. He, he will, he will make his point and will never back down from it. No matter what information you throw at him, he's never wrong and he's good at it because he's, he, he makes you feel like you have to meet his burden of proof. And then he constantly is just like raising the bar clever. and it's very clever and it's infuriating, but you can't help but engage when he, uh, when he does this, you play his reindeer games. I huh? do. And so, you know, Frank's got a little bit of that every now and then we'll, um, but you know, the thing about Frank is he will back down, but sometimes it'll be like, you know, maybe something as simple as, uh, this is the lyric to this song. I'm like, that's nah, not the right lyric. And, you know, we'll kind of go back and forth for a while and then eventually someone will look it up and, and end it there. And history hinges on, uh, history hinges on arguments. Arguments have caused wars. Arguments have caused changes of government. Arguments have propelled some of the, the greatest innovations of our species. And those may be those we can, um, group under rivalries more so, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, Edison and Tesla, for instance. If they didn't have such enormous abiding contempt for one another, would they have explored technology the way they did? I think the answer is no. I think they would have explored something differently. So argument is not necessarily bad. Everyone has it. This has probably happened to you recently when you were, when you were doing something else between the time you listened to our last show and the time you're listening now, you may have argued over something in our mm -hmm. last show for sure. Uh, so what, what do you do? How do you handle this when this happens? Do you embrace conflict or, or does even the thought of an awkward social situation send you into anxiety land like, uh, Mark Corrigan on Peep Show, you know, which is again, I think Noel mentioned it earlier. He's so, my, uh, he's my spirit animal. He's your spirit animal. Well, at least you're not Jez. Uh, so despite the name, homo sapien, modern, wise person, uh, we are biologically ill-equipped for the times of which we live. We are Betamaxes in a Blu-ray world, which is totally inaccurate. I just like the way it sounds. I like it. And it's like outdated technology. So outdated. <laughs> it's like crazy outdated. But the funny thing is, I mean, they're almost both outdated. Yeah, blue, that's the thing. It sounds good, but Blu-rays are also outdated. <laughs> kind of. Uh, yeah, so the... The thing is that the evolution of our technological capability and the evolution of our social dynamic across the world, they've, they've, uh, they've outpaced the biological ev evolution, the biological adaptations that made human beings so suited to that fight or die brutal grind of the ancient natural world in which we lived. We evolved cognitively and physically to outrun, outfight, or outwit predators and monsters in the world around us. However, now we're in a different world. Now the threats aren't so much, you know, a tiger coming at you, uh -huh. let's say, or a bear that you have to fend off to save your family or something. They're much more slow. They're, they're more existential. They're mm -hmm. on paper a lot of times. Yeah, what are some of the terrors of the modern world for uh, people in developed countries, we should say? They're, they're, or people who are well off, the, the things are like, am I leaving a legacy? Is WebMD right? Do I have enough of these hoodies that I like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so I don't have to wash them all the time? Can I get good tickets for that concert or are they only bad, are there only bad tickets left? Yeah. <laughs> and there are real ones too, like, uh, <laughs> ones that are coming up, like, uh, in the current, uh, political movements w that we're seeing in, like, how do governments function, right? It, even though that's, that's a large question, it's something that affects all of us that we have to think about, but it's not something that we can, that you can fight against, that you can fight or flight, right? Well, it's also another thing that's becoming more and more, um, just part of potentially part of a daily concern is threats of, you know, attacks, terrorist mm -hmm. attacks, for example. I mean, obviously we've been dealing mm -hmm. with that in our culture for a long time, but for me personally, and also having a, a child, 
I feel like it's definitely more in the forefront of my mind. Like I went to a political event um, last year and was standing in line and the thought occurred to me going in like, you know what? There, Someone could try this to blow this it. thing up. Yeah, this could be it. And it was very strange because I'd never had that thought before. And it was very like a marked kind of moment. Like, okay, I guess this is how my brain works now. And that is how our brains have always handled the world around us as a constant uh, as a constant background noise of threat music, you mm-hmm. know, the, the music that plays in Kill Bill right before the bride Ring, does anything. Ring, ring. <laughs> Your brain is always on some level playing that music at a very low level, but it's because our hardwiring, however antiquated it is, got us here by being that way. So it was very, very useful in the past. It is still useful, otherwise people wouldn't have it. But what this means is that our brains treat every innocuous argument like it could potentially be a fight to the death. So, so for instance, what's, what's the most, what's the most innocuous argument? Like the dumbest little thing to argue with someone about? Like if you guys were arguing. I had an argument one time about Shoes. I was about to say shoes. Yeah. It, That's uh, so funny. That was literally, that was the most innocuous argument I could have thought of. A mutual friend of ours, uh, Bree, mm-hmm. and I got into a huge argument one time about the need for new, like really expensive shoes and about how I only had one pair of shoes. I, mm-hmm. I, that was exactly the thing that I was going to say. We'll see. There you go. That's weird. You guys have group minds. Well, mine was going to be a hypothetical. <laughs> oh, okay. I actually right. had this argument, but that All was right. literally going to be what it was. That's very strange. Well, so, okay. So even if, if it's this uh, question about new exclusive Jordans or if it's a question about what sort of shoes are best suited to what sort of event, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, if you have a horse in the race, if you have a badger in the bag on this one, then you are your brain is going to treat it as though it potentially will be a situation where one, where you have to thunderdome it and one of you is going to die. And it's an unconscious thing. And this ladies and gentlemen is why stuff they don't want you to know is covering the topic of argument. Cause it's not the kind of thing we would usually cover. Right. Mm, uh, yeah. It's, I think this falls in line really well with the deceptive brain series that mm-hmm. we did. Yeah. And that's because The question is always, who are they Mm -hmm. in this context? Well, friends and neighbors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, future potential uh, foes. This is, depending on how you feel about Jordans, this is a situation where the they are you, or at least your brain, your brains, and the, the ancient eldritch processes that compel us to mistake our programming for free will. And uh, so now that we know that the game is rigged with regular arguments, let's take it a step further. You know what I mean? Let's look at technology. What is it like when you can argue with someone that you will never have to meet in real life? Do you have? Do, do you guys have a story? Okay, I have a really quick story to tell. And it, I think, matches up where the real world and then the avatar that you are when you're speaking or typing online it kind of meet. So there's this game in 1997 when I was in middle school called Ultima Online. Okay. And it was really cool. It was a new game and you could do all these things. Well, I spent way too much time playing this game. Uh, I got a character to 7X GM, uh, which means what does that mean? seven times grandmaster. You have a hundred, you have seven skills that are at 100, which takes okay. forever. And I mean, really, we're talking, I don't know, six to eight months that I spent on this one character. And I bought a boat. I got all this stuff. <laughs> like I was, I was riding high back in middle school. I was like, oh man, this is awesome. Uh, so anyway, they made a change to the game where in certain spaces you weren't safe anymore. Someone could take things from you, pickpocket uh-huh. you, right? Mm-hmm. Or even attack you and the, the guards wouldn't come or whatever. Anyway, I got pickpocketed and my boat got stolen with all my stuff. And I basically, was going to rage quit the game, but there was this function in, inside the game where you could call a, uh, a GM, a game master, also GM. That's weird. Uh, but anyway, you could call them and it was a human sitting at their computer who was like helping run the game who would come in a character and talk to you. And this character came up and I basically, as this little kid was arguing for about 25, 30 minutes yelling like vitriol about how could this happen? I've spent all this time. I love this game. 
please get my boat back. <laughs> Help me. This sucks. And then I said awful things to this person because That's I was like so what? furious. Now, I, I don't even remember exactly what I wrote to the guy, but – it was just in text coming up in a little bubble above my character's well, head. Well, that's important to remember, too, is, you know, there's no context in text. That seems funny to say. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's like you it – all, it just comes across – like you, you have one side of the meaning of the words because you're missing an entire incredibly important component, which is your body language, the tone of your voice, mm-hmm. the sound of your voice, the uh, oscillations of your volume up and down, things like that. And a lot of people talk with their hands and the, there's just a whole – nuance that's missing from online conversation and it can work both ways it can either make you come off as extra mean mm-hmm. or you know that people get confused maybe you're saying something that's meant to be a joke and if you had heard someone yeah. say it in their voice it would be very clear they were being sarcastic that it was a joke but when you type it mm-hmm. out and there's none of those nuances it's very easy to mistake it as someone being a jerk no that's one of the primary differences between most online interactions versus real life interactions. Another one would be that everyone in an online interaction has the ability to pretend to be more knowledgeable than they are by opening another tab, Google at your fingertips. Especially now, back then I was on a dial up on AOL Mm -hmm. and that's how I was connecting through. Did you get your boat back? Yeah. did you? No, I did not get my boat back. Uh, I This explains a lot about like, you because I, I never got my boat back <laughs> you've just been pining for that boat yeah well, your boat hurt <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it is funny though how i transferred my anger and my rage mm. at from that guy from the person who stole my stuff to this game master who completely had nothing innocent. to do with it yeah completely the, the innocent. equivalent of yelling at someone on like comcast customer support or something oh, exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly you know? has nothing to do with it it's just my job to help out but you're you i can't deal with you right now and i would say that's a little bit different because the person who was bearing the brunt of the of the frustration was paid to be there and was not passionately telling you that you had to have better shoes or something. Absolutely. So because we are, as we said, hardwired for survival, let's look a little bit at what what happens in these online arguments. When you are in situations with high stress or you have fear or you're suspicious, Um, There's a hormone called cortisol, which floods your brain. And when this happens, all the all the cool cognitive neighborhoods in the front of your brain, like all all the all the hip new up and coming areas, evolutionarily speaking, uh, they don't function as well. These would be executive functions. They're like strategy, trust building, empathy, compassion. And instead. One of Noel's favorite parts of the brain kicks in, and that is the amygdala. This is the part that makes a uh, a choice about how best to protect the body. Uh, and this thing, which is a very old part of your brain, is the one that says, all right, look, body, we are very close to losing it all in this uh, in this dangerous, dangerous game of Russian roulette that we confused with a pleasant conversation. We have several choices. We can fight, possibly to the death. We can run as fast as we can. We can freeze. Or we can try to kiss their butt. I don't know what, I don't know what'll work better for you. But your brain usually is going to say fight or flee. Yes. The, the, I like that idea of a strategic butt kiss that your brain decides to make. (laughs) And, and this is just for arguments when you, when you're arguing with someone you don't know that well or you don't have that much of a stake in there, you know, it's this is an argument where uh maybe Noel meets somebody in line to grab uh lunch or something and they just say something very offensive and you say, well, hold on, though, that's that's not that's not true, actually, uh, because blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, oh, look at him. McBeardy over here. Look at the pants on this guy. Look at the pants on this guy. Some big boy pants he uh-huh. got there. I love the idea that all of a sudden everything just stops in time. Noel turns around and then you just hear that. 
And what? all of a sudden, it's a fight to the death. What, what is that? It's the Star Trek. Uh, yeah, that's also me calling all my bearded compatriots to come oh. back. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you guys traveled in packs. True. I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to prejud- be you know, open with my prejudices. That's okay. But it's like, why are there always those like other 11 guys hanging out waiting for you? Can't tell you the secret. I've literally never seen you walking in a pack of less than 12 bearded men. You know, there's safety in numbers, my friend. I guess safety so. Safety in numbers. Well, it, lo- it looks good. I think We're going to have to find more out uh, about Yeah, that. we'll have to. That's a different episode. Well, here's what you do. You just grow your beard out a little bit, and then maybe we'll welcome you into the fold. I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm ready. I'm in. Okay. Cool. Traitor. <laughs> uh, so, so, but let's say, like, going back to this hypothetical situation, no, let's say that you are in a long-standing argument, a deep-seated rivalry, uh, one of those arguments that has continued for some reason for years and years and years, uh, and will never reach a conclusion. In fact, it's further and further away from a conclusion. You have like some Edison Tesla kind of deep seated, uh, um, deep seated disgust for one another. Well, it turns out your brain functions in an even stranger way at that point. Now your brain has gone from sort of betraying you by making you a little bit dumber to, um, or a little bit less rational. It's mm-hmm. a more fair way to say it. Uh, to giving you a little bit of something that might be like a mad, mad genius superpower. So in this study at the University College of London, a guy named Professor Semer Zeki uh, scanned the brains of these test subjects as they looked at photos of someone they hated. And I still don't know how they got these photos. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the person said, oh, I hate this person. Oh, it must have been celebrities or something, right? That they I don't know. say they hate. Well, I mean, the methodology is in the study. And okay, it's fairly okay. sound. So, uh, Professor Zeki found that everyone's brain has what he called a hate circuit, and it connects three regions, the superior frontal gyrus, uh, the putamen, and the medial insula. Uh, the activity in these regions correlates with the experience of hate. So if someone says to you, like, oh, I don't, um, who's a celebrity? Ryan Gosling. Okay, so if someone says to you, no, I don't hate Ryan Gosling, you can check to see if they're telling the truth by showing them a picture of Ryan Gosling and seeing if the superior frontal gyrus, putamen, and the medial insula uh, have a higher level of activity. That means they hate this guy. I love the idea of walking up to someone in the street and be like, do you hate Ryan Gosling? No, no, no. Hold on. <laughs> Attach all of the necessary equipment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or anyone. And this this circuit is distinct. It includes parts of the cortex, subcortex that generate aggressive behavior and translate this in, into action through motor planning, which means like a, a very small individual size version of war games hmm. that, or, uh, you know, modeling, strategic modeling. If then, right, if they swing first, I'm going to duck, yep. I'm going to put a foot up in their uh, groin or something like that. I, I had that with... <clears throat> a couple kids in middle school because of my dorkiness. Like, uh, you know, there are those kids that, that you, you think about how am I going to react if you're, you know, a bully, I guess, something like that. Did you guys uh, ever have something like that where you're, you have just planning on how am I going to interact with this person next time? And if then in order to keep yourself from being bullied or yes, yes. To like like a good zinger to get a okay. <laughs> like i guess what a why a comedian learns to be a comedian at a young age right that's right. the kind of I thing see. yes this this is something that I, i'm sure a lot of people do and you know listeners uh we're collectively a pretty diverse group. The three of us here in the studio, everybody out there listening and writing in and helping us find the next episode of a show. So some of you are doubtlessly in middle school right now or in high school right now. Maybe I think, I don't think there's anybody younger than middle school age listening to the show. So, uh, some of you are in maybe middle school, high school right now. And, and you're aware you've seen this kind of stuff happen before. I hope you are not bullying anybody. I also hope you're not being bullied, but it, it is a uh, it is a true skill, and it's one of those um, abstract cognitive superpowers that separates humanity from most, but not all, other animals. And here's the thing about when you really hate someone. We did this in our deceptive brain series. All right, when you're in love, 
you have less activity in the parts of your brain that have objectivity and judgment. So like you've seen one of your friends date someone who's just an absolute piece of garbage. And you and they're like, "Oh no, you know, uh Donovan or Samantha or whatever is just going through a lot. They they need a little money, but their heart's in the right place and you know, they they love their three kids, but they can't talk to them because of their schedule." And and they're like, "You you know Donovan or Samantha or whomever doesn't sound like the most up and up character, right?" And they're like, "But no, I love him or you know, I love her or whatever." I think we've all been in those situations. <laughs> yeah, that's almost another coping mechanism that your brain sort of, you know, circumvents uh, common or rational, rational thought by allowing you to kind of explain away some of these uh, sh- these pretty deal breaking shortcomings. You know? So even though the circuit for hate is distinct, it has a little bit in common. It runs in some of the same circles as the love circuit, which we cover in that uh, deceptive brain video with one really important difference. Brains experiencing hate retain activity in the objectivity and judgment areas, which means you are better prepared not only to plan your next move, but to calculate the next move of your opponent. This does not happen when you are just arguing with some random stranger in the Internet. This happens to people that you hate. So if you have this kind of experience, It can keep you smart, which in terms of maybe cunning is a better word, right? So does this apply online? We did a video earlier where we talked about why you cannot win arguments online. And, you know, I'm sure there are loads of folks out here listening uh, who are thinking, like I used to think, well, I did actually win several arguments online, Ben. So if you want to argue about it, check out, you know, Check out your email, right? Look at this thread. Mm-hmm. However, uh, Noel, you named one of the biggest reasons that it's difficult to win an argument online when you said uh, body language, right? Sure. Body language is missing. Yeah, and I also think that, like, I mean, there's no moderate moderator in an online argument. So, I mean, everyone kind of walks away feeling the same way as they did when they went in. You know, like I, I'm no one ever really gets their mind changed or, oh, and since there's no neutral third party mm-hmm. to say, you know, X or Y won the debate, <laughs> it's just <laughs> all about mudslinging and just, it, it devolves usually into just personal insults because essentially you're missing more than half of what people are actually saying when you cut out, uh, the ability to interpret their body language, their intonation, the sound of their voice. Like I was saying earlier. Oh yeah. Let's get into this because. There's a uh, there's a little bit of myth busting we need to do, but there's also a little bit of uh, <laughs> revelatory stuff we need we need to show people here because we have some numbers on this. You've probably heard this before. Uh, research shows only about forty percent of what we're actually saying matters. People are paying more attention to your body language, etc. Mm-hmm. Lately, that's actually been amended uh, pretty significantly to say fifty five percent of communication is actually body language. Thirty-eight percent is the tone of voice, and seven percent. Wow, yeah, the actual, measly seven. The actual words. So, okay, so does this measure up? Let's look at this. The history behind these numbers—they're often quoted, and the percentages are often misunderstood. They come from a guy named Albert Mehrabian. Uh, Albert Mehrabian is responsible for this this breakdown, right? Uh, and he was—he did a lot of research detailing the importance of nonverbal communication channels, right? Uh, because we've seen people who speak very seldomly, but the rest of, but they are still being very talkative, for lack of a better term, in, in uh, the ways in which they carry themselves, right? Uh, we, <laughs> we have a couple of coworkers who speak rarely, but mm-hmm. uh, they still communicate very well. So, this actually comes, this number comes from two different research studies, uh, both in the 60s, and they combined together uh, to modify that 60% nonverbal, 40% verbal thing into the 55, 38, and 7, because they figured out that intonation does matter that much, right? Sarcasm uh, still is very difficult for people to read based on text alone. There are some ways that you can get around 
some of the sarcasm and some of those things now. I know on like Twitch in particular, they've actually come up with a, an emoji that when you're being sarcastic, you throw the emoji somewhere in the message, which is kind of an interesting way that uh, communication is being is evolving. I think eventually there will be something that you'll be able to denote sarcasm simply by with a click or oh, something. Absolutely. I mean, or, you know, uh, for example, using an exclamation point where when an exclamation point was missing, a sentence might come off as demure or like sounding like, you know, you're not very enthusiastic about something. Mm -hmm. But if you add that exclamation point, maybe two or three, then (laughs) the person that you're chatting with or texting with, you know, knows that you're being upbeat about something. I mean, there's all kinds of little workarounds, not to mention all of the emojis that, you know, we have access to just like through, you know, Androids and iPhones. But that is that is if the other person that you're speaking with understands those symbols and those messages that you're trying to get across, because ultimately it's just characters. And this leads into something. It's an interesting bit of history, which I'll probably pitch to Holly and Tracy over at Stuff You Missed in History Class, one of our peer podcasts. Uh, There have been numerous attempts to create new punctuation characters that denote stuff like an interrobang, which is a question mark, but also an exclamation point or an irony mark or a, a mark to donate, uh, sarcasm. However, these haven't really caught on. So at this point, we're stuck with clarity of communication. The big misunderstanding about this 55387 rule is that it is a hard and fast rule all the time. That's That doesn't make sense because people communicate so differently across the world. What it does show us is that in any instance, uh, the what, how you're saying what you're saying and what you're doing with your body while you say it, matters way more than people might think. Also, intent has a lot to do with it. Like, for example, an Internet troll um, is is communicating for the sole purpose of riling people up. Mm -hmm. So not only will they use language and phrasing in such a way that will ruffle people, they're actually being very pointed and targeted in in what they're saying and creating these argumentative threads. And uh, a lot of times you'll see message boards where, you know, there's somebody on there and is later identified as a troll only after like people kind of react and say, oh, you idiot, blah, blah, blah. You're so full of it. And then someone will be like, uh, he got uh, old, you know, X, Y, Z, 2016, gotcha or whatever, you know, (laughs) I mean, it's a thing. You see it all the time. And they're a little bit different, I think, in there, in the chemical processes that occur in the brain during trolling, because it's not, the point is not to win an argument. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The point is to uh, derive some other sort of cathartic thing. That's true. And so, and do you think people enter into online arguments really believing that they're going to win? Like, do, do you think we delude ourselves into believing that we actually have a chance of changing someone's mind? Uh, sometimes, sometimes one thing that I think may even be more common is when people are, okay, so imagine a person is like a cup and the fluid that a person is filled up with is a belief, right? Maybe that belief is something like, uh, the best video game ever was, uh, GTA or that, uh, Jazz music stinks except for this one album, right? So, uh, or that, you know, my religion is right. If we want to go to that point. So this person, this cup is filled with this, this fluid of belief and this fluid, you know, like any other fluid adheres to the, it conforms to the shape of its container. And then when it overflows, maybe an event happens in the news. That's like an ice cube or something dropping in and that raises the fluid and then it starts to pour over into the outside world. So I'm trying to be very kind when I say this, but my instinct says that often people just want to express the thing they already believe rather than um, think critically about it. So maybe maybe you've grown up hearing that the only real metal is cradle of filth. Right. Okay. I I don't want to get in trouble with the metal audience. This is just for the sake (laughs) of argument. So you as a cup have been filled with this thing that says only metal is cradle of filth. The only metal is cradle of filth. Sort of a a murky fluid. fluid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and by going out and saying it like Mm -hmm. like just going out in the world in some even if it's just on a little online forum somewhere Mm -hmm. and saying that it's it's almost like you're trying to reinforce 
your own belief. Yes. And you are, uh, and you're attempting to find like-minded people. So you guys can all sit together and say, the only metal is cradle of filth. The <laughs> only metal is cradle of filth. And the, the reason this, the reason this happens, and this is a very crude analogy, but the, the reason this happens is because of kind of a tribalistic pack mentality. And we are much more like, uh, we are much more, um, synthesizing creatures than we are original thinkers. So we take stuff that has already existed in our cup and we just let the cup overfloweth. You know what I mean? We're not actually making the thoughts in many cases. So you can also see these online arguments that are very impassioned as proxy wars uh, because someone who didn't actually invent the thought just heard it so much they believed it was true. Heard it so much they believed it was true. They, they end up just being kind of a, a puppet of a pre-existing opinion to another puppet of a pre-existing opinion. And it's a sad thing, but it's a reality. Another reason you can't win a lot of arguments online is that the act of arguing tends to reinforce those pre-existing opinions. So if I am a cup and I'm overflowing with the only metal is cradle of filth and then, uh, Matt, you or you, Noel, or you listeners say, well, technically, I looked up the definition of metal. And while yeah. Cradle of Filth may be your favorite of this genre and its many subgenres, it is factually inaccurate to say that it is the only example. So confronted with the facts, what would I do? Well, do we have those those three options from uh, earlier in the show? <laughs> yeah, right. right. Mm-hmm. Fight, flight, four actually, freeze, freeze. Uh, or peas. I don't know if people would peas. Um, it's rare for people to roll over and show their belly in online interactions. Very true, because you know there's such anonymity. Well, here's what Brendan Nyhan and a guy named Jason Reifler discovered. They discovered something they called the backfire effect, which means that if you guys had like a metal intervention with me and said, here are several other metal albums. Furthermore, here's some albums that if you like Cradle of Filth, you will probably enjoy immensely. Mm -hmm. And if I still thought that same thought just running like an earworm through my head, then what I would end up doing is saying, no, no, you guys are wrong. We're not friends. You don't know what you're talking about. You're offensive. You're stupid. Downvote, dislike, unsub. And the funny thing is, is like, you know, you can get away with that stuff online, I guess, because no one's really trying to be your friend. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if a buddy of yours kept behaving that way, you'd probably find a new buddy, you know? I mean, just, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that everyone has to be the same, but when people just are inherently closed minded and closed off to any other possibilities other than what they believe to be the case, it's sure. just not any fun to talk to them, you know? It's just not. I mean, even if you're into arguing, that gets old real quick, mm-hmm. you know, especially about something as arbitrary as, you know, Cradle of Filth is the only metal. It, uh, it's so. making me think of a con- the concept that thoughts can be viral or are, in a right. way, neural Means. viruses. Mimetic, yeah. Yeah, and some of the, it, it kind of takes me back to the Invisibles and Filth and some of the work mm-hmm. of Grant Morrison, just mm-hmm. some of the ideas that if you have a thought that is dangerous enough and you are able to spread it, the thought itself is the thing that is dangerous, not whatever comes of it. Right. Does the thought function as a sentient being? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's an interesting idea. Um, and it's something that we've talked about off air, which, you know, I would love to, I would love to explore in a future episode too, because we're already, we're already at the, in this situation where the evidence or the truth of whatever something might be doesn't necessarily matter. The backfire effect is related to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, of course, where if you, uh, think of yourself as a skeptic and you say, if you think of yourself as a skeptic, then you should be saying, I, uh, I am interested to hear about this UFO report and see what, if anything, is anomalous about it. Many people who confuse themselves with skeptics practice confirmation bias and say, aliens are not real, or I heard the term conspiracy theory, therefore whatever follows after this is automatically wrong. If anything, that's the opposite of skepticism. So in a situation where the evidence or the truth doesn't necessarily matter, when people on any conversation from closely held 
personal values like religion or politics to very arbitrary stuff like Anchorman 1 versus Anchorman 2 or Pepsi versus Coke or whatever. Uh, what we find is that, again, our brains are hardwired to prize feeling correct over being correct, even when there's not even when there's not really a correct answer. Like, I, I don't know how you guys feel, but if it's a soda, it's a soda, it's a soda. You might have your favorite, but I don't think there's an inherently superior one. Well, it's like you said at the beginning, too. It's it's the difference between argument being this functional kind of um, defense mechanism where you are actually protecting yourself against something. Now, it's almost more like a sport, you know, and it's, that's certainly sure. how people treat it online a lot of the time. I mean, it's definitely you are trying to get that, I guess, dopamine release that comes from the satisfaction of feeling like you have won or you are right, you know, even mm. if you aren't. And almost it's, it benefits you to maybe ignore the fact that you're not right. <laughs> right, you know? yeah. Ben, you said something in the video that I thought was fantastic. You were like, this idea of being right is a, is addictive mm. and so much so that it is a drug that you, the feeling of being right all the time would be such an all encompassing feeling that you would want to chase and chase and chase. You said it would be like if you're Kanye West, like that feeling of everything I say, I believe is right. And, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what anybody else says. I believe that this is right. Mm. And so it's just, I was trying to imagine what that would feel like yeah, just you, constantly. You guys are, both on point. We're getting to this very important thing here that you can become phys physically addicted to this dopamine and adrenaline rush, dopamine triumph that occurs when you think I am right. Yeah, I'm not even listening to you. I'm the just only right. metal is cradle of filth. <laughs> dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Wow. I, I mean, this it's it's a strange thing. And again, you know, I'm just mentioning cradle of filth or metal for the sake of argument. Yeah, I mean, we're all stars now on the dopamine show. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're saving that. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Shout out to Marilyn Manson. Uh, so when yeah, so when you argue, when your blood, your uh, brain rather floods with these uh, different chemicals, and they even make you feel invincible. So. The next time you're in a tense situation, your brain remembers, right? And your brain says, well, let's fight. We don't need to run because if we run, we don't get the rush. You know, fight for the rush. Yet, let's say, let's say that all of us listening now, all of us on the show now, say that each of us has some sort of amazing revelation and we are able to transcend these things. And we say, you know what, you guys, I'm sorry I was being uh, such a piece of crap about it. It was cartoonish that I believed there was only one metal band in the world. And in retrospect, it's weird. And I appreciate you guys for being so honest with me and listening to me. I apologize. Let me take you guys out to the Dave and Busters. <laughs> Let's see that we were all capable of doing that. Well, there's still another problem, another reason that you may not be able to win arguments online, because your chances of finding an argument, finding a contradicting opinion, even if it's correct, are lowering at a continued rate. We're talking about something called the search bubble. So what what is this? This is a thing you may have noticed recently in when you're just on Google or really any other search bar or on Facebook or some other social media network that you use. What's getting uh supplied to you, to your feed or to your search results is more and more it's being customized for you, for what you've searched for in the past, for what you like on Facebook in particular, or what you, uh, what you buy even. A lot of times it's matched up with your credit cards, which is a little mm -hmm. bit creepy. Um, and it's happening because mostly advertisers want you to have what you want. And, you know, and that's getting into maybe even places where your news sources, the types of news sources on your news feed are going to be different. Are you saying even non-sponsored posts, like just normal things that you like that come up in your feed are reorganized and reordered based on your browsing behavior? Yes. That's really creepy. Yeah, that's, that's why. Yeah, that's why if you're signed into Google 
uh, and you're on Chrome or something like that, yeah. your results are going to be different than if you were just not signed in anywhere and mm. using, Go- uh, using Google Chrome on, on a different computer. And here are how dramatic these differences can become. You can use uh, search engines that strip some of the personalized information that Google uses. Mm. Uh, there's DuckDuckGo mm-hmm. and Scroogle, and you'll see that the search results you get uh, do differ. Mm-hmm. Almost regardless of what you look up. Yeah, it, it scares me sometimes when I'll type in stuff somewhere on a computer and then stuff they don't want you to know shows. I'm like, yeah, awesome, man. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, so there's a TED Talk you can watch about this if you're interested in learning more uh, by a fellow named Eli Pariser, Pariser uh, the author of a book called The Filter Bubble. And, he, and he's talking about this personalized search. So. As they say in an excellent article on youarenotsosmart.com, the media of the future may be delivered based not only on your preferences, right? Whatever you looked up, yes, even in incognito mode. Yep. Uh, it will be, it will also be based on your voting record, your medical records, where you grew up, your projected mood, the time of day, the time of year, maybe even information gleaned from your text message conversations, right? Even public records. Mm-hmm. Like perhaps how much you make if you work in a public position. Have you applied for a loan recently? Mm-hmm. Are you getting dental work? Why? Yeah. Did you make an unusual purchase? And the biggest one, are you about to have or have already had a baby recently? I don't know, man. Another big one that makes me uncomfortable is when I see when I'm hanging out with a friend. And for some reason, it's almost always uh, one of my female friends and I, I see like, wow, you have a lot of ads for engagement rings mm. and diamonds. And that seems to me, that seems so unfair because we already live in a society that tolerates pushing people to do uh, ritualistic things that maybe don't even apply in our society at this point. It's a, it's a form of it is a, as if Hal from Space Odyssey 2001 decided to pester you to the point of bullying. You know what I mean? That's crazy. I know it's not, it's not the best, but Hey, maybe it's all wrong, right? No, maybe we can just, uh, maybe we can be better. Maybe we can have rational discourse, throw off those old social dynamic rules. What do you think? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 but it's not a fair fight though. You know, I mean, our odds just are pretty abysmal. You don't think we can evolve past the physiological limits of the brain and break Free of these, uh, algorithms that keep us from discovering things that may, uh, change our view of the world. Cause we're all made of star stuff after all, you know. I, I don't know. You're right. Maybe our odds don't look good, but I think there are, there are older pieces of, I'll, uh, you know what? I'll take a page from L. Ron Hubbard's book and call it cognitive technology. Uh, the Socratic method is an excellent way to explore differing opinions. Of course, it takes time. A lot of people don't have it. And a lot of people, when you're in an argument online, I don't know, listeners, if you ever played this game as kids where you were like, you had invisible guns. Do you remember this, this game? Sure. Like, oh, we're sure. going to pick two sides or whatever. Um, so the, uh, the, the thing that happens with that is, you know, like if we're playing this, if you, if you're not in a family like yours, Matt, and you're playing with invisible guns, one thing you'll notice is a lot of people say, Oh, I got you. And then someone's like, mm-hmm. no, you didn't. Yes. That's what, that's what internet argument is. It's imaginary bullets, that's imaginary great. weapons. And people are expecting to play the honor system on who got shot. So of course, I don't think it's going to work out, but these are things to keep in mind. And we would like to hear what you think about the strange ways in which our brains deceive us and force us to think that we are living in a different era and the, the way in which one of the, the main conspirators in your quest for any factual thing, any truth, maybe uh, an inside job, maybe the person in, in between your ears all along. And it's not your fault. These are processes older than civilization. <laughs> yeah. I've, we need to find a way to suppress the amygdala, Ben, but I feel like that's a terrible. Yeah. That would be an awful know. world to live in. Ooh. I, I don't know. I'm sure people have conducted experiments like that. You know, we, we do know that 
it does change brain function when you reduce electrical activity in one part of the brain, even using an external source like uh, uh, TDCS, mm-hmm. right? Which still is somehow, it's not illegal, right? <laughs> but no one will sell me one. <laughs> I know. I'm going to have to just build one. I'm we can pro- do it. I'm we probably going to give myself brain damage, but I'm going to do it. Uh, anyhow, oh, and listeners, if you know of a, TC, a TDCS device, please. Uh, yeah, send one our way. <laughs> write to us, send one our way. But before we go, it's time for some feedback and some listener mail. Listener mail, listener mail. Now it's time for listener, listener mail. mail. Listen up. All right, so we had a lot of feedback from our political conspiracy episode. And we had some uh, differing views that we wanted to share with share with everybody else listening. And there were also a couple things that I wanted to amend or corrections, which, which we're grateful for all of these. So Kelly M wrote into us and I'm going to read a portion of this letter because I, I want to take a look at this. Uh, Kelly's talking specifically about the part where I, I kind of went on a rant about my own personal opinion. Which again, Noel, especially thank you for pulling me off the back from the ledge on that one. So Kelly, Kelly says she likes the show. Uh, I don't usually have a reason to write into podcasts, but something was said during this episode that frustrated me. I apologize if it was corrected later in the podcast, felt the need to stop and write the email before finishing the podcast because I was afraid I forget if I uh, waited. It was stated that there should be a law that if someone in your immediate family is in politics, you cannot hold the same or similar office. I think that's the gist of what was said. Correct me if I'm wrong. My problem with this is that the way it was discussed in the podcast was from a very white male viewpoint. Historically, those who hold political office have been white men, not in all parts of the world, but, you know, certainly U.S., Canada, Western Europe, for sure. Uh, So if the proposed law were an actual law in this country, it would disproportionately affect women who are seeking public office. It would be much more difficult for the goal of a 50-50 representation in the House, Senate, White House, etc. to actually happen. The women who are using familial connections to get into these positions of power are paving the way for other women who do not necessarily have these connections. While I agree with that family dynasties do not line up with the idea of America being a meritocracy, meritocracy, let's be real. Can we really call America a meritocracy anymore? And I thought... You know, that's that's just a piece of Kelly's letter. But we mm-hmm. talked about this off air and I wanted to bring this to the rest of our audience. You know, um, here's here's what I'm thinking. I'll, I'll reply to this directly because it is my opinion. Uh, it seems that the argument is that the evil of nepotism is a lesser evil in comparison to uh, the greater evil of misogyny and prejudice against women in uh, positions of power or equality, right? But the, the, the assumption I see here is that there's this idea that by virtue of being women, uh, people who are women and are elected via nepotistic or elitist means will inherently or inevitably or necessarily help someone who is outside of that circle. I don't know. That's a lot like trickle down economics. Uh, so I, while I see, I see the opinion and respect it. I'm a little, um, I'm a little more skeptical of how that, how well that would work. But again, one of the things that everybody pointed out, including, uh, Matt and Noel on the podcast, when I talked about this and everybody on YouTube comments were like, well, I see where you're going with this law, Ben, but there's no way to enforce it. Yeah. So it's somewhat of a moot point. Well, and I, and I slightly in, in, after thinking about it for a long time, I slightly disagree with the law, but I was going to put forward one that you had talked about before that I think is even better. What's that one? Then instead of eliminating, eliminating nepotism through familial means, I think we just eliminate the ability to, to hold office if you have ever been in a secret society. Oh yeah. I remember that one. That was one of those three laws. What do you think of that, Noel? Um, I'm kind of on the fence, you know, it uh, depends on how much weight you put behind the particular secret society. And what is a secret society? Yeah. Any society which is made secret from the public uh, in membership and <laughs> or in duty. Hmm. Okay. Seems fair. I could go with that one. Uh, also, uh, we have another, we have another slight correction here. I had said, 
and I think this was me, we had talked about the difficulty for felons to vote in the U.S. It is not true that no felons can ever vote in U.S. elections. It is true that it goes state by state. There are 11 states which do not allow, which, which are pretty much do not allow felons to vote. However, there are two states that have unrestricted voting for felons. Those are Maine and Vermont, where felons can vote in prison. Nice work, Vermont. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. And the person to uh, help illuminate us, uh, and hopefully you as well, listeners, with that uh, with that slight correction, is Drew Richards. So you get a shout out as well, Drew. Thank you so much for your time, and thanks for checking out the show. And even more importantly, thanks for keeping us honest. And one last mention here, I wanted to say thanks to Kelly D for putting us on to the Democracy Now! episode called Dark Money that's kind of a deep dive into the Koch brothers and where that money goes and super PACs and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was it was cool. Great. Uh, no, any, any, we got anything else? I think I'm good, guys. All right. Uh, well, we are going to head off and argue with each other old school, the old school way in real life. I'm already shaking my fist at you. You are. You are. And did you know there's... And you, Matt. No. There's some evidence that shaking your fist in the sky like that or holding it in that Darth Vader pose increases pain tolerance. Story for another day. Ooh, uh, I'm going to try that out yeah, later today. Story, <laughs> yeah. Try it out today and report back and let us know if it works. Oh, you know, I do have one thing before what, we close. What's yeah. uh, You know, the, uh, we had Julie Douglas on uh, a couple weeks ago or mm -hmm. last week talk about the stuff of life and yeah. uh, the show has launched and an episode that just came out today uh, the day that we're recording rather um, is uh, features uh, you Mr. Bolin uh, if anyone wants to that's true I do a lot of things yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go listen to that I right think, after uh, this it gives, it gives you a little <laughs> glimpse behind the Ben Bolin uh, curtain well I will say uh, you know that I have a high opinion of Julie Douglas and you and Julie have been working in concert on this show for quite a while stuff of life mm -hmm. And it's kind of an immersive podcast experience, you know. So immerse yourselves in the meantime. Uh, we are going to be researching some exciting new stuff, and we want to hear from you. So, do you And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.